Hi, my name is Adi Osmani and welcome to my Reddit AMA. Question one, what makes a great JavaScript developer or developer generally? Let's talk about what makes a good developer agnostic of language. So you need to be a good problem solver. You need to be able to think analytically and take complex problems and break them down into a series of much smaller steps which you can then go and solve. Uh, you also need to be quite open to learning. So always be open to learning new things. Something that, that I and Paul Irish uh, say quite frequently is that the best developers are people who are learning something new every day. And, and you don't have to be learning something um, that's quite extensive. You could be simply iterating on uh, knowledge about a particular framework, for example, that you're using at the moment. So let's take uh, handlebars.js as an example. Uh, you might be using it for some, you know, so for some basic things in your application right now, but why not spend even 20 minutes during a lunchtime, uh, sometime during the week, just trying to figure out, you know, other things that you can do with it to improve your workflow. It, it's something that doesn't necessarily need to take a lot of time. Uh, you don't have to do all of this in a single session. You can actually spend a little bit of time during lunchtime every day when you're at work because you know it's, it's, it's free time for you to do whatever you want, eat some food, learn something new. And by the end of the week, you've actually amassed a new piece of knowledge that you can apply to personal projects, to work, and it can help. That, that, that helps make you better. Um, another very important thing is communication. You need to be able to take very complex ideas and explain them in simple, simple steps so that anybody can understand them. Because uh, if you're not able to explain in just a few sentences what it is you're doing, maybe there's something wrong with that. Maybe you don't fully understand the problem um, or what it is you're trying to solve. So be able to break complex problems down um, into simpler things. Um, humility. Humility is important. Um, something that you'll find with developers as they get older is that we, we sometimes lose humility and I think that it's an important point to stress that you, you need to keep your humility. You need to remember that we're just programmers um, at the end of the day. There are no real rock stars. There are just experienced programmers and programmers who are still getting there um, and are still spending time learning, trying to improve their skills. Uh, and we need to help people out as much as we can in those areas. But at the same time, um, you know, a, a little humility goes a long way. Question two. So why do you work at AOL? <laughs> All right, so this is a question that uh, I'm asked quite a lot, seconded only to, oh my God, you guys still exist? But um, AOL is a great place to work. There are some very, very talented engineers there and uh, it, it's fun working with them. But AOL is quite flexible with the technology stacks that we're allowed to use. So if we see something on the market that's just come out and we think that you know it's gonna greatly benefit a project, we're allowed to, in a lot of cases, just roll with it. And, and something that I've been allowed to do, at least in the past, is if I see a new feature that's just landed in Chrome Canary that isn't necessarily available on all browsers, as long as I polyfill that so it does work cross-browser, uh, we're allowed to just roll that to production as long as it's been tested properly, which, which I think is pretty cool. Um, AOL's also been great with sort of letting me go and speak at conferences and um, understanding sort of uh, giving me a little bit of time to contribute back to open source um, around all of our other work. So so yeah, it's 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 a cool place to work. Um, I know that you know we're made fun of a lot, but we we do we do have some interesting things going on. We've got some great people working there. Question three. What would you advise someone with only six months of very junior experience on how to improve their skills? Uh, the three things that any beginner should be doing is reading, writing, and experimenting. Uh, read books, um, you know, write code because as much as it's great to read and you will pick up a lot of knowledge, um, the only way that you're really gonna push your skills forward is by writing actual code, making mistakes and learning from those. Um, it doesn't matter if you're sort of writing code on, on you know, your own small projects or, or whatever, um, but experiment, write code and experiment. Um, as a beginner, as long as you're doing this sort of on your own time and you're not experimenting in like a production level application, um, you should be okay. Uh, you know, I, I find that when beginners set themselves a little challenges, like uh, how can I reverse a word or a sentence in JavaScript? Or, um, you know, how many, can I find out how many times um, a particular character occurs in a sentence? They're just these little tiny problems that, that you can set yourself and you can then go fig and figure out, okay, well, what do I need to be able to do in JavaScript to achieve this little task? And once you've picked up enough of this sort of baseline um, knowledge, you can then start building things that, that actually accomplish real world goals. 
Sort of on top of that, the physical books that I'd recommend beginners looking at um, are JavaScript, The Definitive Guide. Um, I would say that that's by far the best um, book on JavaScript that you can get at the moment. I know that uh, many people will say, you know, the first book a, be a beginner should read is JavaScript, um, The Good Parts by, by Douglas Cockford. Uh, I say that it's a good book and certainly one that be a beginner should read, but perhaps not the first book you should read. I think that um, that book considers, it, it assumes a lot of, of baseline knowledge that you have to have. And the definitive guide covers those things. So do the definitive guide first and then do that. If you're looking for something a little bit lighter, Eloquent JavaScript is an amazing book and you can get both sort of a, a free version of that and a revised um, physical version if you want or an ebook version of that. The MDN is of course a great source of knowledge. Um, and, and there are a ton of other free books that you can pick up to, to learn these things. Uh, I also have a book on uh, JavaScript design patterns that you might find useful. And in addition, there, there are other ways that you can learn. Um, Codecademy uh, has, been, has been fantastic. And if you're, if you're an absolute beginner, that really will help you um, get to a place where it's a little bit easier for you to start reading these books. Um, question four. Given the fact that jQuery does support AMD, but backbone.js and underscore don't, should I really stick with it or toss it away? That's another great question. So I think what you're referring to is when Jeremy Ash Kennis decided to remove the optional define calls from um, underscore.js, which are related to AMD. Now, this isn't so much of a big issue because AMD.js, which is a group on, um, on GitHub, are actually the people who are now sort of maintaining and driving AMD. Um, as a modular format, and they're now uh, maintaining patched versions of backbone.js and underscore.js. So if anyone wants to actually use AMD compatible versions of those libraries, you can easily go to the AMD.js group on GitHub and pick up those versions and, and start using them right away. I'm using those right now in production and we're not having any issues with it. So um, no, I, I don't think that you should, you should drop using AMD. It's a really great modular format and um, very, very robust for, for quite a few um, of the needs that we have these days. Give me five. So you have a really good reputation as a JavaScript developer and contributor to the community. I don't know about that. Um, I run a site that sends a free JavaScript newsletter weekly. I started this year and noticed it's very difficult to make people care about this if you're not socially recognized. What would you suggest to a programmer with a fairly good development knowledge and a lot of interest in contributing to the community to succeed? Um. So I have a few ideas here. Um, the first thing that you need to do with your newsletter is make sure that you've set a fairly good bar for quality. It, it's, it's very, very easy to find content to just stick in a newsletter these days. There's always gonna be jQuery plugins. There's always gonna be new JavaScript libraries coming out. What you have to do is make sure that you set a nice high bar for the quality that you, of, of what you're gonna include in your newsletter. Um, I think this is a challenge that other newsletters are, are constantly facing and are constantly trying to balance out properly. Um, the next thing I would do is remember that in this industry, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about this industry, I'm talking about our part of the industry, JavaScript specifically, people aren't just, sat or they're not just going to be satisfied with lists. So if you tell people, well, hey, my newsletter has the top 100 jQuery plugins, they're not going to be that excited about it um, because there are so many different facets to that, right? There's not just the top 100 jQuery plugins. There's like the top 100 templating solutions and the top 100, um, you know, frameworks for structuring your applications and the top 100 this and that. There are different, you know, there are different facets to that information. So a top 100 list isn't really going to be that useful. What I would say is consider instead what information and what articles and videos and stuff are actually going to help developers on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what are the big problems that, are, that, that they're facing um, at the moment? And you can find these things out by just reading, you know, go through Twitter, find out, you know, if you, if you search on Twitter for JavaScript, you'll start seeing the types of questions and concerns that people are regularly discussing. And you can use that as a source to sort of drive the type of content perhaps that you consider including in your newsletter. You know, and you know, in, in terms of, I guess, improving visibility, that's always a challenge. It's constantly a challenge when you're starting off to try to get more people to look at what you're doing. Uh, I would say consider partnering up with, uh, I guess, other companies or other sites or other Twitter accounts that are uh, already well established. Uh, you know, if, if, even if there isn't a chance for cross-posting, which is definitely something I, I, I talk to them about, uh, you might you might be able to convince them to retweet some of your materials. Question six: What are the most useful things for mathematics that a JavaScript dev should know? Good question. So actually, there's quite a lot that. Um, a programmer, not just a JavaScript developer, but a programmer in general, or can learn from mathematics. 
um, if you know you wanted to apply a filter to an image to to morph it or, or, or sort of make it grayscale or, or something like that, um, a knowledge of matrices and matrix transforms will really help you there. Regardless of sort of if you wanted to do it with, with Canvas or HTML5 or whatever, um, that knowledge will help you. Um, if you're looking to start writing online games, you know again C++ or JavaScript, um, understanding statistics, arithmetic, probability, vectors, all of those things will greatly help you. Question seven. Being the backbone is relatively new and I don't see you on the list of contributors. How do you already know so much about it that you can write books on it? Good question. So I've been extensively using backbone um, for, for quite a long time, ever since it first came out. And I've been using it for everything from building um, mobile web apps to sort of non-trivial large applications. We were using it a lot at AOL. And sort of in addition to that, I, I have a number of friends that are um, core contributors to Backbone that I lean on whenever I have questions that require uh, a closer knowledge of the source. Um, and uh, in my opinion, you know, a lot of the technical books that are written these days don't necessarily have to be written by a contributor or a framework author in order for them to be authoritative. Um, as, as long as you have a thorough understanding of a particular framework, a particular language, or a particular library, um, you should be able to, to quite intelligently write about the topic in a way that makes sense and hopefully covers a lot of the gotchas that um, developers are going to be running into when they're using those things um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I hope that covers it. Question 8. Who was the best tech editor you've ever worked with? This question comes in from Alex Sexton. Uh, the best tech editor I've ever worked with is definitely not Alex Sexton. That guy was horrible. What with his yay queries and his yep nopes and his handlebars plugins. I mean, I don't know what he's thinking. Um, I'm just, I'm kidding, of course. Alex Sexton is amazing, one of the best developers I know. Uh, he was the technical reviewer for the first version of Essential JavaScript Design Patterns, for anyone that's read that. Uh, and, and he's been great. Um, another guy that has been sort of invaluable to me over the past year or two has been Andre Hansen, who's been a technical reviewer for a lot of the content that I've put out over the past while. So yep, those two guys are great, and I thank them very much for everything they've done. Give me nine! So Deberthia asks, with so many jQuery plugins available these days, how do you wade through it all to find the cream of the crop? That's a very good question. Um, I actually have a set of requirements that I use um, whenever I'm deciding whether to use jQuery plugin in production level applications. Um, does it have suitable documentation? Have they actually gone through and explained exactly how it works? Have they mentioned all of the gotchas um, and all of that stuff? I need to make sure that if I'm using something, I'm not going to run into a whole brick wall of stuff that I have to get over just to make sure that the plugin works correctly in my application. Second, unit tests. Unit tests are very, very important. You need to make sure that if someone says that a plugin, you know, does X, Y, and Z, that it actually can be proven to do all those things without you having to go and test all of these behaviors on your own. Because obviously, you know, if you're, if you're developing something, you're going to have to be testing your own application's behavior, and you shouldn't have to worry about making sure that a plugin does what it says on the tin, right? So unit tests are important, documentation is important. Um, also make sure that the plugin uh, is up to date. Something that you'll often find is that when you're Googling for jQuery plugins, you'll find something that might do exactly what you want, but you go and you check the jQuery version that it supports, and it could be something that's years and years old, like, like 1.3.2, for example. And that, that can be a problem because there are actually very, very well popular sites that will hold off on upgrading to newer versions of jQuery that are more performant and are more optimal to use and have new features just because they've been tied down to specific plugins because they don't support the newer versions of jQuery yet and they're, they're no longer maintained. So that's another consideration that I have. Um, something else is support. So does it have um, a mailing list? Does they, you know, do the developers actively have an IRC channel or, or answer issues on you know, their GitHub repo for the project or, or whatever have you? Question 10. Developers like you, Paul Iris, Zeldman, Divya, Yale, etc. are almost becoming rock stars in the web development community. You've done work that's benefited a lot of developers and consequently there's a lot of buzz around all of your next big projects or ideas. Are there any perks from being well known in the community? Do other developers give you first dibs on joining what will become a high profile project? And what about the downsides? Do you feel pressure to do too many conferences or come up with the next big thing? So I'll answer the first of those questions. Um, are there any perks from being well known in the community? Um, I guess I guess there are a few. So when you write something or, re or you release a new project, 
Uh, you get a slightly higher level of visibility than you would as a newcomer, which, which can be a great thing, but it also comes with quite a few expectations and a little bit of pressure. So the expectations are that what you release is going to be of a high level of quality, that it's going to be accurate, if it's an article, that it's going to be accurate, that it's going to be fact-checked, that it's going to work, if it's something functional that it's been properly tested. And that can, that can mean, you know, a little bit more work. Uh, over the past two years, uh, most of the articles that I've released have gone through technical review, regardless of whether, you know, I've been writing something for Smashing Magazine or another magazine or, or whether it's going on my site. Um, which can mean, you know, a longer lead time to something actually going out. Uh, I've also had to make sure that everything gets fact-checked, so that can that can take a little bit of time too. But it's it's nice getting more people looking at something because it means that perhaps you'll get a lot more feedback on the project and maybe more people contributing back into it, um, you know, in the short term. But it's also nice, you know, getting getting your work out there and getting people to actually look at it because it means that if you're trying to teach people something, more people are learning and you're spreading that knowledge to a slightly um, broader net, which, which, which I think is really cool. So the next question is, do other developers give you first dibs on joining what will become a high profile project? I... I don't think so. Um, the way that most open source projects work, regardless of size, is that when you start off, you, you really start picking developers to involve based on um, you know, their experience of doing something similar in the past, whether you think they're going to be useful in a sort of consultancy role, which is, which is something a lot of people pull me in for, or whether they're actually going to be useful for sort of committing code to the project. Um, and what you'll find is that you know, there's, there's usually a balance between the number of people who are relatively perhaps well known in the community um, and the people who are unknown but are also very talented being brought into projects. So if you take a look at anything that the uh, H5BP group, so the people who release things like HTML5 Please and, and HTML5 Boilerplate um, have been doing, if you go through the contributor lists, um, quite a few of the people that are doing a lot of the work there are actually not necessarily well known. Um, they may be people who have a lot of skills or you know have a lot of their own open source projects that may be smaller in size but are still quite amazing. Um, and they're just people who want to help improve projects. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be brought in because uh, you know someone may have been seen something else that they were working on and thought that they'd be you know really helpful in the project or, or something like that. But on the whole, um, I wouldn't say that. You know, being well known influences that much uh, how many projects people are going to invite you into, regardless of whether they'll be high profile or not. So the next question is, what about the downsides? Uh, I've already mentioned pressure, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. When you start getting involved in a number of projects which have perhaps you know a high level of visibility or a lot of people watching it, um, one thing that happens is that you start to get a lot of requests for features, and a lot of people will be emailing you on a daily basis saying, well. I would like this improved or I would like this done and, and so on and so forth. Um, what that can mean is that you have this challenge of balancing out your contributions to all the different projects that you're involved in and you that, then have to pit that against um, your desire to create new things. So today for example, today's a Saturday, um, in addition to sort of recording um, this video, there are three open source projects that I have to do work for and probably two or three ideas that I really want to start some work on on top of that. And I have to juggle how I'm actually going to balance all of these things out so that I don't neglect the projects that people are already using, but I do get to spend a little bit of time experimenting on the new stuff that I want to try out. Uh, and it, it all comes down to time um, and time management. Time management is the biggest challenge that you experience when you know, you're dealing with high profile projects. Do you feel pressure to do too many conferences or come up with the next big thing? Uh, I would say the answer to both of those is actually no. Um, I don't feel any pressure at all for those. So with conferences especially, um, if it's not a part of your main job, you're completely free to pick out you know, how often you speak, regardless of whether it's a couple of times a month, a couple of times a year, or, or not at all. And finally, um, my friend Mike Taylor from Opera asks, who wins in a knife fight between Charles Bronson and Charlton Heston? I am gonna say Heston. Uh, I don't think you can. I don't think you can beat Heston. You know, Buffalo Bill, Ben Hur. There is no way that Bronson could beat Heston in a fair fight. No way. Unfair fight, maybe. Bronson would probably play dirty, but I think that Heston. I think Heston would win a fair fight. 
And that is it for my Reddit AMA. I hope that I've answered everybody's questions and I haven't put too many people into a coma. If so, I'm sorry. Uh, and yeah, um, if you're gonna be in Canada in a couple of months, I will see you at the next FITC event where I'll be talking about polyfilling the HTML5 gaps with tons of demos. And yeah, that's it for me. I will see you guys around. Thank you.